Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Execute Scent Control, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scent Master, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Icon Cameras, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. On this week's episode, we've got two segments for you. I'm going to start out by talking about my bow setup. I'm going to go through the whole thing, all the different accessories I use, and the way that I set this thing up and exactly why I do that. Then we're going to come back again with a segment from Brett Joy up in New Hampshire. He does some hinge cutting in an area that he recently purchased where he's able to conceal his food plots from a nearby road. So let's dive into this bow setup first. There's, uh, there's a lot of different philosophies on uh, how you set up a bow and a lot of it depends upon how you hunt and the situation where you find yourself. So this is going to be really focused on uh, whitetail hunting setup. I always feel that it's important to be able to get off a quick shot. Being able to time the shot and uh, get it off at the exact moment that you need to, a lot of times in whitetail hunting is more important than being pinpoint accurate at long distances. And I want to have the best of both worlds, so I want a real accurate bow at long range too, but I want to make sure that if there's a deer walking through my shooting lane 10 yards away and I've got a little narrow gap to shoot through, I need to be able to time the shot and I need to be able to get it off quick. Uh, and, and exactly when I want it to go. So that factors into some of my setup. Uh, also, being able to connect quickly to the bow without having to look down at it. I've had whitetails surprise me before where I'm sitting in a tree stand. And that's happened uh, two or three different times for me and I've been able to kill those deer. But the reason has been uh, making sure that I have my bow set up for quick shooting. So let's go through it. Uh, that's my overall philosophy. The uh, first thing that's obvious here is the quiver. I've got the fuse convertible on this bow and any good uh, quiver that you can take off the bow, you know, fuse makes a bunch of great quivers, so take a look at their whole line, but uh, I want one that's removable. And the reason I, I like a removable quiver is uh, due to the fact that if you've got this quiver hanging on your bow, it's going to change the balance of the bow. And if you've got this much surface area extra on a crosswind, it's gonna to wanna to blow the bow a little bit more than it would otherwise. So you're dealing with a balance issue and you're dealing with a stability issue with a crosswind. It's a lot easier to hold this bow uh, level and in balance than when I've got this on the bow uh, along with it. So it's just, like I said, it's something you get used to. If you're shooting with your quiver on all the time, make sure that you shoot with all the arrows in it all the time because every time you take an arrow out, it does change the balance of the bow and the bow reacts a little bit differently in your hand uh, when the string starts to, to move forward. So that's that part of the setup. The sight itself, I use a five pin. And this is a fuse interceptor and uh, this, this uh, sight has been replaced in the fuse line by the Helix. The most important features of this bow, or, or of, of this sight, are very rugged pins. And I've had uh, sight pins before break when I was pulling uh, bows up into a tree stand or even just sneaking into the woods you catch on a branch snap off uh, one of the fibers from the fiber optic site then you're stuck uh, so I want one that's rugged and this one is rugged it protects the pins really well it's a five pin sight five pins is important to me because I want to be able to shoot accurately from 20 yards out to 60 yards and the 60 yard shot is not a typical one that I'm going to take in the field but it's one that I'll practice a lot uh, when I'm getting ready for the hunting season because it makes those shorter shots seem a lot easier. So if I'm shooting a lot of 60 yard shots in the yard uh, and I've got to take a 40 yard shot on a buck that I've been hunting for two or three seasons, I feel a lot more confident than if my, all of my practice is, is on the 40 yard shot. Then that's going to feel long to me, whereas practicing at 60, that 40 yard shot's going to feel short. Uh, so that's why I have so many pins on there. And they have to be bright. Uh, this site has very bright pins, uh, so th those are important features. One other thing I look for is a site with a round pin guard. The round pin guard is important to me because I center the entire pin guard in my peep site. I've got a large peep site, it's a quarter inch diameter, and it's a, a meta peep made by G5 Outdoors. 
being able to have that large peep gives me a, a wide field of view. Even with one eye closed, I can see deer moving uh, you know, into my shooting lanes. I can keep track of things a lot better that's, that's taking place around my, my uh, tree stand. And also it allows a lot more light in. So in low light situations, I still have a pretty good uh, uh, visibility through the large peep. The downside of a large peep is the fact that you lose precision if you're trying to center individual sight pins uh, within the peep. So rather than center individual pins, I center the entire pin guard. The next feature of the site I want to talk about is the bubble level. And I run into a lot of situations in a tree stand where I'm aiming down where uh, I notice my bow is not vertical. And it's real common when you're leaning forward especially that you, you tend to tip the bow in the direction that you're leaning. The reason that causes problem for people is, is uh, as you tip your bow to one side it tends to want to shoot in that direction. And uh, we could go through the you know the how the gravity affects the arrow but when the bow is straight vertical the arrow goes up and then drops straight down when you lay the bow over now it goes to the side and it doesn't drop back to the left if you're leaning it to the right it drops straight down so it's going to shoot to the right of the target so it's going to it's going to miss on whichever side the bow is leaning toward so that's one that uh, you know having the bubble level can really fix that especially in tough shot situations where you've got to lean over a branch or you've got you know, something maybe just a little bit awkward in the tree. That's my sight uh, and my peep sight set up. I'm going to talk next about my knocking point. And this comes back to that topic of being able to load quickly. Most people now use a string knocking loop and they'll use a release aid real similar to the one I've got here which is the Scott Silverhorn that has a single hook that you can hook onto the knocking loop and, and uh, you know, makes a nice clean uh, release and, and uh, a quick way to load with a loop. Uh, like I said, being old school, I like being able to snap the release directly onto the string. And I've got a Scott Shark here. And this is the, the release that I hunt with. So basically I can hook this thing up real quick. Uh, don't have to you know, worry about pushing that loop out of the way when I'm trying to get in there with the hook. Uh, I can come in there with the two jaws, boom, I'm in, and uh, really almost foolproof. When I've gone to loops before, I've had a couple of moments that were a little bit uh, panic-stricken, where the loop wasn't quite exactly where I needed, and I had heavy gloves on, and I couldn't get everything hooked up quick. Uh, so that's, that's the simple reason uh, for using the, the double-jaw caliper release style and going straight to the string. I overwrap the string serving uh, with, I think all I use is just an old bow string, take one of the strands off, then I overwrap the area where the release aid goes on the center serving, and that protects it from wear and tear from the release aid. Uh, above it, I've just got two brass knock sets, real simple setup, and below it I just have a knot tied with string knocking loop material. That's my eliminator button. That separates the release jaws from the arrow knock so that my release doesn't damage the arrow knock. Now let's talk about the rest. I like this, uh, this is the Hoyt Ultra Rest and there's a really a really cool uh, uh, feature to this rest. And that's the fact that when you click it up that arrow cannot ever be any place other than where you need it when you draw the bow back. And being a shoot through rest the uh, uh, or a drop away rest, sorry. The rest is out of the way just as soon as the, the, I release the string. I don't have any interference with the fletching. Uh, it's a perfectly accurate setup. It tunes really well. And I never have to worry about, like I said, where the arrow is at when I go to draw the bow back. So that's part of, of setting up an idiot proof bow. You want to eliminate all the things that can go wrong that you possibly can when you're setting it up because at some point, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And unfortunately, it always seems like when it does, it's when you've got one of the biggest bucks in the whole woods right in front of you. All right, what else we got on here? The stabilizer on this bow is the carbon blade from Fuse. This is the six inch, I think, or six and a half inch model. And I don't need a heavy or long stabilizer to balance this bow. Uh, the Carbon 34, Carbon Spider 34, uh, balances really well without a whole lot of extra uh, attachments on it. But what I do like about this stabilizer is it's, it's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of uh, moving parts that can soak up vibration. And vibration is noise. 
So if you can get noise or vibration out of the bow, you can remove noise from the bow as well. It also makes for a little bit more of a pleasurable shooting experience when there's not vibration in the bow. The carbon risers are really good about sort of dampening out that vibration in the first place. So this uh, little short stabilizer is the final step in that. Okay, let me talk about my release aid next. And like I said, this is the, the uh, Scott Shark. And if you look at it, I've got it on the very shortest setting. There's three settings on this one. All of the Scott releases are adjustable for the length of the stem. And as I make this thing short, the intent is to contact the trigger well inside the finger from the fingertip. Most people think that they want to have the, the uh, trigger at their fingertip. See, it's, it's well inside the fingertip for me. So when I draw this back and I've got the pressure of the bowstring pulling on it, it stretches it out some, but I'm contacting it at the first knuckle of the index finger. And there's, there's a lot less sensitivity uh, because you have less dexterity at that joint. Now when I start squeezing on it, I can't feel uh, when that thing is going to go. I don't feel the tension building nearly as much as I do out of my fingertip. So I can perform a surprise release a lot more easily by bringing the release stem shorter and, and bringing the trigger down uh, further into my index finger. And that's my intent on every shot that I take is to, is to create a surprise release so I don't know when the bow is going to go off. And that's one of the uh, easiest ways that I can make a small equipment change to help me do that. I'm shooting the Bloodsport 2 arrow and this is a really light, uh, very straight shaft. And I, I do like the Impact Series or the, the Bloodsport 1 series with the small diameter because I know that promotes better penetration. However, they're a little bit heavier and the biggest issue that I've ran into over the past few years has been string jumpers. I've not had a problem with enough penetration to kill the deer that I'm shooting at. Uh, my biggest problem is whether or not the deer is still going to be there when the arrow gets there. And we could go, go into a long discussion of string jumping and I'm sure we will at some point again. But the bottom line is if you have to stop a deer or if the deer is alert at all and you take a shot past 20 yards, uh, here in the Midwest anyway, uh, that deer is going to start to drop down to load its legs to run off. From hearing the sound of the shot, it's already starting to drop down by the time the arrow gets there. So I want a faster arrow. I did a whole bunch of studies on this, did all the, the number crunching, and I came up with uh, the conclusion that increasing my arrow speed uh, was a better uh, solution to the string jumping problem than trying to make my bow quieter. So this arrow gets me down around five and a half, somewhere around five and a half grains of uh, finished arrow weight per pound of draw weight on my bow. So the actual bow that I'm shooting is the Carbon Spider 34. And I don't have a lot of choice because my draw length is long. I need to get the 34 with the long draw setup. But even if I didn't have a long draw length, I would still be shooting this 34 inch uh, axle to axle length bow because I like the added stability that comes with a slightly longer bow. And we talked about the physics of stability and the longer it is, the more inertia it's got to uh, oppose any kind of quick movements that I might make. Like I said, they're just a little bit more forgiving when they're a little bit longer. I think I've covered everything on here. Uh, I'm sure that we can come back and hit on a few more of these topics as we get closer to the hunting season. We start talking about shooting the bow. And I'll probably talk in the next few weeks about some tips on uh, shooting the bow and, and shooting it more accurately. Well, that covers my bow setup. Now we're going to join uh, Brett Joy out in New Hampshire. Unfortunately, in the Northeast, we're really limited as to where we can put food plots because of our soil type and our topography. We don't have a lot of flat ground that's really easily planted and tilled, and we also have very, very rocky soil. So unfortunately, this plot that we're in today um, is on a good area. It has good soil. It's pretty flat. Um, it's actually going to be stumped and graded so it's a nice tillable seed bed next month but it's actually right along a road. And it's not a main road, it's a dirt road, maybe a class four road. It's not heavily traveled, but it still is not ideal um, for a food plot location. So one of the things you can do um, to make a visual barrier between a food plot and a road or a food plot and a house or a bigger area is to hinge cut trees. And that's what I've started to do here, as you can see. Hinge cutting is a great tool. Um, it can be used for many different things. Today we're using it to deter deer movement and to create a visual barrier, but also is great to create bedding cover and to increase your browse per acre on a property. What you're going to do is you're going to cut the tree a half to two-thirds of the way through and then bring the top of the tree down to the forest floor. 
What that's going to do is create more uh, browse on the forest floor because the deer will be able to access the top of those trees. And it's also going to increase the sunlight to the forest floor and uh, promote regeneration and new growth, which also is um, going to create more browse and bedding for the deer. But the main objective of uh, this hinge cutting project today is actually to make a visual barrier to allow the deer to feel more comfortable in this plot and to also stop people passing down the road from seeing into the plot. Um, the other reason is, is we want to deter deer from moving between the road and this plot in this particular area because I have a muddy tree stand right here in an oak. Anything downwind of this stand is going to be hinge cut and that what that's going to do is deter the deer from using that as a travel route to get to this food plot. A lot of deer are crossing this class 4 road to get to this food plot and uh, we don't want them to come down with a stand. So hinge cutting back in this area is going to, um, going to encourage them to come from further north or uh, further south and not directly behind the stand to the east. So the act of hinge cutting a tree is actually really simple. Um, you want to cut the tree halfway to three quarters of the way through and then bring the top of the tree down to the forest floor. Um, and you want to cut it just enough so you're able to do it yourself and bring it down without breaking the uh, trunk of the tree. Um, the important part is, is to try to keep a good portion of the cambium layer of the tree intact. So the cambium layer of the tree is the layer of the tree that delivers um, nutrients and moisture from the roots to the rest of the tree and allows it to live. If you keep a good portion of that cambium layer intact, that tree will actually live for an extended period of time. I've had uh, trees that I've hinged several years ago that are still actually living. Some people like to use a chainsaw for this. I actually find it easier to use just a handsaw. Um, it's safer and it actually works just as fast in my opinion. You don't have to lug around a chainsaw, you don't have to wear chaps and safety equipment and it's just a lot easier. Uh, maybe if you're going to hinge some bigger trees, maybe up to six inches in diameter, you might want to use a chainsaw, but most of the trees in here are between, I'm saying, three and five inches, so those are the ones we're going to target. You also don't want to target your uh, mass crop producing trees like oaks um, or any of your trees that could potentially one day be marketable timber. So today we're going to really target um, maples and beeches and some occasional birch. Well, I'm going to start on this maple, and actually this maple is leaning this way, so one thing to note is always try to uh, make it easy on yourself and hinge the tree. Um, the opposite way of where it's leaning, that way it's easier to pull it down. So I'm going to get going on this maple. Well, we're just wrapping up here today. We just finished up the rest of our project. As you can see, we've made a, a great visual barrier here. We've made kind of a mess. Um, hinge cutting isn't pretty, but it is very effective. So we're hoping this uh, works this fall and uh, we have some good hunts over this food plot. Well, that's it for this week. I appreciate you joining me and we'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big. <laughs>